Welcome to Middle Age Can Be Your Best Age, the show designed to help make middle age your prime time of life by defying the notion that once you reach 40, 50, or even 60 years old, your crowning achievements are all behind you. Regardless of whether you're just approaching 40 or are firmly entrenched in your middle years, it's time to launch your very own personal journey toward a joyful and purpose-filled second half of life. Each week, host Roy Richards, an expert on midlife renewal and author of A Midlife Challenge, Wake Up, will discuss the challenges common to middle age and help guide you to a brighter tomorrow. Now, here's Roy. Well, right now, our sons and daughters presently in college or planning to start college this year are hunkered down at home wondering what comes next. Will college campuses reopen in the fall, including dorms, fraternities, and sororities? Or will most students remain at home taking classes online? Well, my next guest alerts present and prospective college students to ask themselves two far more essential questions. One, once I graduate, will the college courses I'm taking me on now prepare me to earn a living wage performing work I both enjoy and admire? And second, do I have in mind a post-graduation exit strategy with a clear idea of how I intend to market myself and monetize my skills once I leave school? And my guest is former college professor Glenn Dunsweiler, and he points out that colleges don't teach business, but upon graduation, our sons and daughters will live it. In fact, he tells us that most colleges and universities are setting our youth up to fail and to make matters worse. uh, worse, So many students graduate college with humongous uh, student loan debt that has to be repaid and a lack of an income stream or strategy to repay it. On a positive note, Glenn is also here to suggest to us parents and grandparents ways we can help our students overcome the college curriculum deficiency and prepare for career and life success. And here are some of Glenn Dunsweiler's remarkable qualifications. He's a filmmaker, producer, and public speaker. And in 2015, he moved from professorship at Cal State San Bernardino to the business side of entertainment. Low on funds, he then voluntarily took off on a four-month journey to uh, research the subject of homelessness. With almost no money, he slept in his car and on park benches and researched and interacted with hundreds of homeless folks to determine who was homeless and why. And he subsequently produced a documentary film on his experience. And uh, he's also written two books. Uh, The most recent one we'll highlight today, A Degree in Homelessness, Entrepreneurial Skills, for students, and it's not really about homelessness, it's about how students can avoid that. And hello, Glenn Dunsweiler, and welcome to Middle Age Can Be Your Best Age. Hello, and yeah, thanks for having me. Well, let me begin by asking what you mean when you state that our colleges and universities are setting our students up to fail. How, what in fact are they leaving out in designing their college curriculums? Sure. So ultimately, we can't forget that schools are businesses, and schools will provide us what we want. (laughs) Schools don't necessarily provide us what we need. And so if you want to take a course in underwater basket weaving, they will develop a course in underwater basket weaving, (laughs) and they will sell that course to you. Now, If you have any desire to make money in underwater basket weaving, that course will probably not teach you how to make money in underwater basket weaving. In order for you to do that, you'd have to take a business course or a general business course that would then tell you how to give people joy and provide a product that people want and find a market and and do all these things that that everything in the rest of the United States runs on the back of, which is capitalism and business yeah. and every other industry, but we don't teach the business side of what those industries run on the back of. So yeah. if you want to learn literature, well, what is the business that, that pushes literature forward in the United States? If you want to learn biochemistry, you know, uh, the, the STEM fields are better at – giving people a living wage or a job with a living wage out of college. But still, 
how does that make money? How does biology make money? And we do not teach that. I have a niece and her husband majored in philosophy, and I don't know how they make money with that. <laughs> right, right. And and I think that's that's setting people up to fail. And a lot of times, in worst case scenario, they're getting degrees that have no demand. And yeah. so you get out and you really have nowhere to go to get a job. And that's what we're setting people up is to get jobs, not necessarily to start their own businesses. And in this climate, part of part of being successful is setting up your own business possibly, not just yeah. working for someone else. Well, if it's true that our colleges and universities aren't adequately preparing our young people for success, are you advising us as parents to discourage our sons and daughters from attending a four-year college? Wouldn't they be better off just attending a local two-year community college or trade school to learn a lucrative money-making trade like nurse, medical technician, plumber, or mechanic? <laughs> right. So... That's a delicate balance, right? And, and if you have a student, if you have a child, you know that they don't want to listen to you, no matter what. You can tell them whatever. So recommend don't want to one thing and they'll do the other, you say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you have that battle to hit. And I think that the more realization that you can give them, the more conversations you can have, the more challenges you can have with that's great that you want to do that. How are you going to succeed after you gain that knowledge or get that degree? And challenging them to answer that question and not just letting that question not be answered. I think that, and working with them, not saying, hey, look, you can't become a musician because it's not, you're never going to make it and you should just become a lawyer. But that doesn't work. I mean, students that want to become musicians will become musicians. But then you say, okay, now my job as a parent is to figure out how you can succeed being a musician, and you have to work with me on this. We need to figure out how you can spin that into a lucrative career. Yeah, I know so in your book you strongly encourage uh, people to go to college for other reasons uh, along with learning to make money, but uh, you're not telling people not to go to four-year colleges just because they don't have uh, the perfect curriculum for uh, making a living later. Right. I'm saying look at college as a strategy, not as an end result, yeah. because we have a lot of students that are looking at that. They think, okay, well, if I get a degree in pre-law, that means that I'll go to law school. Well, <laughs> maybe. And I, 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 I'm in Los Angeles and I was talking to a lawyer and he said there are far too many lawyers. The <laughs> business is just there's a glut. There's a glut of lawyers. Yeah, so if you have always to keep you saying have, that when we keep turning out more. <laughs> yeah. And and they're all fighting for the same contracts. They're yeah. fighting for the same work. So um you have to be savvy. You have to find out what the demand is in society and even though you don't want to and you're not interested just like I call business and entrepreneurial skills like eating your vegetables. You know, <laughs> students don't necessarily want to eat their vegetables. They And they're, they, they're young. They can live on McDonald's. Yeah. You know, they can have hamburgers and hamburgers and be fine. But at some point when they hit about 25 and McDonald's is starting to kill them and they start to feel it, they remember, oh, yeah, there are these things <laughs> called vegetables. And my yeah. parents told me about them. And maybe I should go back and look. And right now, with business and entrepreneurial skills, they don't even have that that in the back of their mind. They are just lost. Yeah. Well, as they're, you point out, colleges, public and private, are themselves businesses that must attract qualified students to cover their expenses. Now, uh, how should uh, a college really uh, try to recruit students instead of those college brochures telling prospective students how fun, cool, and competitive their degree programs are, what should they be promoting? Great. They should be promoting the opportunities you have to succeed with the knowledge that you gain at the college. So yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a look for after. It's a constant look at after what you will be doing with the, the degree you gain afterwards. And 
the only way that colleges are going to do that is if their students are asking that question because yeah. they're not right now they're not incentivized they should and they shouldn't be they're a business they yeah. give us what we want they give you joy hey we have the coolest fraternity on on <laughs> on campus and really that's what the student wants to hear that hey they've got an awesome fraternity right <laughs> i'm going there my daughter was, was considering a college we visited in ohio and it was a friday night and you could hear the roar up on the hill where the fraternities and sororities were and fortunately she decided not to go there <laughs> but i wasn't really right. impressed by that <laughs> yeah well and i know i know students that go to smaller universities because of smaller class size and yeah. in quieter rooms. But is that something that you can utilize afterwards? If it is, if it's a strategy that will help you focus on what you're learning and allow you to concentrate on how you're going to succeed afterwards, great. If you're just running from people and not in noise, well, guess what? The world outside of college is very noisy, and there are a lot of people. You know, so if you, again, are you setting yourself up to fail? Are you running from something you're afraid of or not good at? And is that going to be useful to you afterwards? Because if you're running from something that you're not good at or afraid of, the world is going to hit you with that as soon as you graduate or very soon after. You can't hide forever. No, right. Sure. And and I know I know students that want to hide in college forever. They never want to. Get graduate because the world is scary. The world does not care about you, right? So they just keep racking no, and up. Once you home. walk in the door, the degree may have gotten you in the door of a, uh, an employer, but once you're in that door, they really couldn't care less as long as you. Uh, it all depends on what you accomplish and uh, how proficient you are once you're there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, does your critique of undergraduate education that it doesn't prepare students for doing business well in the new world, does that apply to graduate degrees as well? If your son and daughter were to go on and get an MBA, wouldn't they receive all the skills they need to thrive in the modern business world? <laughs> so I talk to uh, MBA people with, with Master's of Business Administration, and yeah. If they had a clear view of the networks that they wanted to get into, so let's say they wanted to use, go to UCLA's MBA program, Anderson School of Business, they wanted to meet the people from Anderson School of Business and grab those connections. That's why they went. Yeah. The ones that went because it was UCLA said, this was dumb. I should have just started a business, yeah. you know? <laughs> Because I didn't learn how to run a business, I learned I learned all this theory, and I made these great connections. Well, I went to business school, and that was exactly my conclusion. I learned a lot of great theory at the University of Chicago, but it really didn't help me when I got out in the business world much at all. <laughs> right, right. And so, I, I mean, I went to graduate school for lighting and sound design, so live oh. entertainment. The, well, the thing was... That, so. There were always jobs for that, but never high-paying jobs. Yeah. And at first, I never thought, well, I don't need to, I, I, I was of the mind, well, I, never, I don't need to make that much money. I just like, want to do what I'm, I'm, I, I, I care about. The problem is it was so little money, it strapped me to be able to move forward. It wasn't sustainable, right? So yeah. there's this grad school that will teach me this business model that is broken and I never paid attention to that until I was in the middle of my graduate program. And I thought, well, that's bad. Let's not do that. <laughs> you and know, you were saying they, that your graduate program didn't allow you to do any outside work while you were getting your degree, which doesn't make correct. a lot of sense yeah. to me. <laughs> yeah, well, and it was because it was so intensive. My grad, yeah. I learned a great amount from my graduate program, and I actually don't regret it. Yeah. But I really should have looked – at the business of what I was doing instead of just doing what my parents always told me to do was follow my passion. Yeah. They told me to follow my passion with no deference for the real world. Yeah, that, that, that sounds great until you try to survive on it. 
Well, let's move on to where the rubber meets the road. Let's say your daughter or son presently or soon will be enrolled in college. You rightfully indicate that college students need to learn how to value themselves rather than waiting for someone else to tell them how much they're worth. Any suggestions on how to estimate your own value when you're first employed and over subsequent years of employment? How do you do that? Yeah. So... Even people that I taught with, when you had a job, money was something your employer never gave you enough of. (laughs) And we just have that way of thinking. When you're an employee, money is something that that someone doesn't give you enough of. Well, what is money? What is value? Why do I get compensated with the amount of money I do? What and ultimately, it's what joy do you give to people, what value is that, and is that value scalable? And if it's more scalable, people will give you more money for that joy. So if you start thinking about that, you can start thinking and strategizing to figure out where your passions can lie to make you money. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that students, if they if, – the other thing is – I was always waiting for someone to tell me I was worth something. And that is the complete backwards way of thinking, right? I mean, your parents have to tell you, you are worth something, not because you're my son or my daughter, because you are worth something to other people. And you have to figure out what, what it is that you are, and that, that you can give a value and figure out how to exploit it and not negatively exploit it. But how As you point out, it? not all of us are in sales, but every one of us needs to uh, market ourselves throughout life. Can you suggest the yeah. best way to let others know that you have something to offer that is of value to them? I guess first you have to believe it yourself <laughs> before you convince yeah, someone well, else. So perfect example was my dad is a musician and a music teacher, and he always said that musicians were prostitutes. <laughs> and because and he always looked at things negatively, but everybody is their own brand and market and product. Yeah. And if you can look at if you can look at yourself as a positive product, you can say, "Look, I have value for some people in this way, and this is how they will value me." I.e., a prostitute with sex, right? <laughs> it's like, well, this is. And this is, and, and I'm a high-priced hosti- prostitute, or am I a low-priced <laughs> price prostitute? You know, I mean, you're looking at yourself, and, but you're not framing it in a negative light. Which I think, yeah. if you're not in sales, you always we love to buy things, but we think selling things is dirty. And I don't know why we got into that. When I grew up, there was always the myth of the the dirty salesman. You know, the the, yeah, the sleazy sales, sales, sales guy sales that's trying to take advantage. Yeah. Why, he, why he or she why is really performing a valuable yeah. function telling you about a product that you might have a lot of value in. Yeah, and they're ultimately trying to give you joy. You want joy, they want to give you joy, they like talking to people. That's why they're good in sales. They're good at 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 really conveying good feelings. And that's what people purchase. They purchase good feelings. Well, in terms of uh, telling yourself, can someone learn to be an entrepreneur? I always thought that uh, successful entrepreneurs were born with the spirit of uh, adventure and a willingness to take advantage of chances. Uh, can ent- entrepreneurship be taught? I think that maybe good entrepreneurship can't be taught, but I think entre- the entrepreneurial skills, the entrepreneurial mindsets, yeah. Can, it's something that you exercise. You know, maybe you're not a God-given athlete, but if you exercise, you become better at exercise. You know, <laughs> you, maybe you're not going to, to be the fastest runner. Maybe you're not going to be the best entrepreneur, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't have any of the skills. Yeah, and you and can also, think, as you point out, uh, community is so important in uh, being successful. So you generate a partnership with other people that uh, perhaps more have more entrepreneurial skills, but you add to that your portion of it, and you can succeed as a group. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, well, the other thing that I was taught that was a complete mis- misrepresentation was my dad always said, keep your head down and work hard, right? <laughs> you hear that. But what that got me was taken for granted. 
Because yeah. I was best known secret by some people that decided that they were just going to pile on more work because yeah. I didn't keep my head up. I didn't, I didn't connect with people. I just tried, I decided that my work was going to speak for itself. No, you have to speak for yourself. You have to say, I did a good thing, and you have to not be ashamed of that. Now, obviously, you, you can't be too full of yourself, and you can't be arrogant, but there's, that you can be proud of the work that you do, and you can t- say, I do good things, and this is what I can do for you. And, that, and you build connections, and you build people that, you build connections with people that find a value in you and in, in connecting to you, and that sustains you. You know, one of the things that I never was good at was connecting with people, and I just, I just, I, I let that skill atrophy until the past five years, where it's, uh oh, this is where I, my, my failure. I need to fix this. Yeah, you know? now you're doing it all the time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And even, even, even smiling, right? Entrepreneurs smile a lot. They're, yeah. They give joy. Joy's in a smile. And I've well, is it realistic smiling. and possible to begin creating a personal business plan on your first week or month in college, then revisiting that plan and updating it throughout your college career and looking for opportunities while you're still learning? Is this realistic? And your knowledge to uh, most college career counseling centers, uh, are they set up to help students accomplish such a plan before they actually graduate? They are not. Uh, I know some high schools that are doing that. They're kind of private high schools for success. But, again, it's incentive. If the students are asking for that and the students say, what are you going to do to help me push me to figure out a plan for my future, then, then I think the, the universities will respond in kind. But I, I think it's ultimately you, just as, as we had guidance counselors in high school, I think we saw them once a semester. Yeah, they weren't much worse. You know, I mean, it, it might be a, an idea to have legitimate entrepreneurial business counselors yeah, that, that meet yeah. with students. You know, it's going to take an extra bit of resources. So we have to we have to shore up the the career center. We have to redefine what the career center is. But again, if the students want that the students will get that because the business will react to what their their market wants. And if they're losing students because, let's say, UC Riverside starts doing um, career center, more active career center things, and UCLA starts losing students to UC Riverside, well, I think UCLA will start doing things. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Just so they don't lose them to Southern Cal. <laughs> yeah, whatever it is, you know. I mean, you, you build them these rivalries and these teams, and you know that's that's another conversation. But but let's really, talk, it, instead, so let's talk briefly about your latest book, A Degree in Homelessness? Question mark Entrepreneurial Entrepreneurial Skills for Students. What motivated you to write this book? So teaching for 11 years in universities and having juniors and seniors come to me and say, Glenn, I don't know what the heck I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to make money. And then when I moved to Los Angeles and started learning these entrepreneurial skills myself, thinking, my goodness, my students need to know this. That's what really pushed me into I'm trying to grow people into wealth in this country. We, we grow poor people really well in this country, and I would really like <laughs> to well. not do that. I would yeah. really like us to stop growing poor people. It doesn't help us at all. So that's God. That's kind of why God's I'm... creating those poor people. It's up to us to make them rich. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Well, is so. your book intended for educational professionals, or can students themselves and their parents also benefit? It's definitely for students first, uh, students oh. and parents, but anybody that doesn't have entrepreneurial or business background can pick yeah. it up. It's and it's it's an easy read. It's it's simply laid out, and yet respectful to an intelligent reader. It's, I don't I don't speak down to anybody, but it's um it's meant for anybody that just does that needs an intro into the way a business a successful business person and an entrepreneur thinks. So even if you've been out of you. college for 20 years and you're 42, you could still benefit if you don't have those uh, business skills you need then. Absolutely, absolutely. 
Well, where's the best place for our listeners to go to preview and purchase your book, A Degree in Homelessness? Uh, your favorite online retailer. It's up on Amazon. It's up on Kindle, uh, so Barnes & Noble. It's up on other, on the other online retailers. Well, please give us your website address where listeners can learn more about you, your books, uh, your videos, and your uh, public speaking, all those good things you have there. Uh, absolutely. So it's a heck of a last name, Dunsweiler, but GwenDunsweiler.com. And uh, Glenn only has been... one N in it instead of two. It's G-L-E-N-D-U-N-Z-W-E-I-L-E-R, right? <laughs> correct, correct, correct. And they can find you on Google too. They are on, uh, I shouldn't say go. I mean on uh, absolutely. Yeah, Google. Well, in conclusion, let me cite my personal experience. I not only earned a four-year BA degree in liberal arts, I went on to earn a master's degree in business administration. And if anyone could be fully prepared to make money in business, shouldn't it have been me? Well, guess what? All of that business theory and techniques I learned in pursuit of my master's degree didn't help me one iota in succeeding and moving ahead in business. It took me years to learn how to be an entrepreneur, and it was by chance. And I only wish I'd had Glenn Dunsweiler's book as a reference way back then. But fortunately, your son and daughter, and perhaps you, have an ample opportunity to read it now it would be a great gift for a college bound student and as Glenn puts it you'll learn to fuse your dreams with making money something all of us should seek to do and please don't fool yourself into thinking you don't want or need money we all do as Glenn pointed out and if you have too much money give some to your favorite charity <laughs> but that will be the least of your problems and once again, that's a degree in homelessness, entrepreneurial skills for students by Glenn Dunsweiler. And thanks to me and Glenn uh, for guiding Thank our you. college kids on how to make more money. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Well, coronavirus restrictions are beginning to lift in most areas of the U.S., but we continue to spend a lot more time than we used to on our own and in small groups. And it's a great time to broaden our horizons and explore new interests. Are you a dedicated fan of poetry? Well, whether or not to expand our horizons, for the first time ever on this program, I'm going to feature as guest a poet, Devorah Major, who will publish a new collection of poetry in about a month titled Calephia's Daughter, a book of her poems that explores and celebrates the mystical foundings of California. Uh, one reviewer calls it an investigation of a great poet woman. And Devorah Major is no Joni come lately. In fact, she's San Francisco's third poet laureate, an award-winning poet and creative fiction and nonfiction writer, performer, editor, and part-time senior adjunct professor at California College of Arts. And she's also a poet in residence of the Art, Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. And she's published five previous poetry collections, and her connection to California inspired her to explore the stories in this new collection. And her African-American heritage inspired her to title her book of poetry, Calafia's Daughter. And hello, Deborah Major. Welcome to Middle Age Can Be Your Best Age. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Thank you so much for having me. Well, to launch today's discussion, can you please tell us how your state received the name California? That's quite a story. Absolutely. Uh, Cortez, Cortez was on a ship, and a third of his crew were actually uh, people of African, and, and evidently a couple of them knew how to speak local languages. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, he was reading a novel uh, uh, by a Spanish author, a pulp novelist, and in it there was the novel surrounded around a queen uh, named Calafia, and uh, Calafia lived on a rocky island uh, with lots of gold and wore gold, and it was peopled by women Amazons, and men would come there and they would just like make babies with them and then send them on their way or something. <laughs> and uh, that was, you know, and he was really enthralled by the novel. So when he got uh, south of San Francisco to, you know, and he saw steep, uh, quite a bit south, uh, more like Monterey area, okay, yeah. up steep rocky cliffs 
uh, as were described in the book. And then he had the people on his his uh, boat that were dark skinned, and then he thought that well, there'd be dark skinned people here. So Ooh. he decided to name it after this Queen Caf- Califia in the book <laughs> he's did. I have to note that there were some West Africans who, in the book, they came before. Columbus are said to have already come and been in Southern California, oh, right. and they were called Califuna Mandinka. Oh. So anyway, so California was named after this, uh, for Cortez, fictional African Amazon, and in fact, if you go to the Mark Hop- yeah, the Mark Hopkins Hotel in San Francisco, uh, in their banquet room, they actually have a, uh imagined rendition of the black uh, Queen Califia as opposed oh, to the blonde that's on the state emblem. Well, I used to live in California, and I never had the faintest notion of that uh, legend. So that's really uh, fascinating. Well, in the tradition of the legendary Queen Calipia, one of your reviewers states that your poems seek to embrace the intimacy, big mind, and love howling from the Blave Bowl Island of Calipia. And uh, perhaps as a preview of your uh, collection, could you please recite a couple of the poems in the book, I'd, I'd love to hear that. And I think two of them are especially relevant to uh, today's times. How about Mix Ancestry and I Choose Love? I love those two poems. Okay, Mixed Ancestry. I, a planet varied sea to calm. Sorry. I, a planet varied sea to land, calm to storm, wondering in the mirror where did the eyes come from and the texture of hair, who contributed to the skin tones and who to the lips, thoughtfully dividing the source of my limbs, my hips, my face. I, landless, homeless, being so much a mixture, a coos coo of spices and fruits, a mongrels of the comings together chosen and forced of so many different ones, a crossbreed that fills the spaces between rich, dark, and translucent fair, a mutt that has unloosed woolly fur cropping out in varied shades, ears and tail being strangely incongruent. A grafting of culture that insists where love fails, life will persist, thrive, recreate. A planet varied, mountains to hills, to valleys, to chasms, deep waterfalls to rivers, to streams, to ocean wives, a melange I claiming my space in the rainbow. Well, I think that's a great description of California, of the diversity of population and the diversity of uh, scenery and culture and, uh, and the topography of the state. <laughs> that's a great poem. How about the one, I Choose Love? That was probably my favorite of all the poems. Oh, thank you. Uh, um I choose love, not seeking perfection nor the puzzle, peace falling perfectly into place, broad strokes, unexpected turns, I unlock the doors of my heart and choose love. Boy, that would be a great uh, required reading for everyone in the country right now. (laughs) Well, when will uh, Califia's daughter be available to our listeners to purchase? It will be available in July. It's going to officially drop July 31st. It'll probably be on, available you know, online and like that a couple of weeks before oh, that. Great. That's great. And when available, where would our listeners go to purchase it? Well, you know, I am a great believer in independent bookstores, so I would encourage people to do it. I do. I do not know in my mind. There is actually a website for independent booksellers that they all go to where you can just order books from your you go to your bookstore that in your city oh, and yeah. you see if they're connected to it and then you go through basically a portal of theirs and then you're helping to support independent bookstores but if that's not possible and unfortunately in so many in fact in the in the city that I'm currently living in in California there're no independent bookstores oh. uh, it will always be online at Amazon and Barnes and Nobles and those kind yeah. of places <laughs> that's the easy way to do you it. You know, that's, you know, but, but, but I do encourage anybody that, you know, to, because uh, the fact is that, that I have, um, this is my 11th book, but all of my books have been put out by uh, small presses. Oh, uh, right. with their, or there are only a half a 
dozen large presses in the United States. There's yeah. imprints under them, but they're not very many. And so some of the small presses were bigger small presses and some were smaller pro- small presses. But the reality is that they sold well because of independent bookstores. Yeah. And so I would love people to support that because they let in the authors that are not necessarily mainstreamed, um, anointed. Yeah. And you also have a website people can go to and learn more about you, and you have some fine readings on that of some of your poems. What's that website? That is Devora, and I spell Devora with a V, D E V O R A H, major, M A J O R, Devora Major dot com. And yeah, I'm, and I have a lot of interviews with artists. Uh, I just put up something on the current things happening with all of the um, uprisings uh, yeah. across the country. I have I interviewed my father for a couple of years and did tapes with him. Oh, uh, uh, and I have the journey of the tapes because he was born in 1926 and has seen a lot. In fact, one of the ones yeah. up there is about the riots of New York and. 1943, I believe, if you want to compare. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know there were riots during World War II. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so so that, that um, yeah, I, I try to make it interesting and to attract a lot of different people and ideas and encourage people to comment and yeah. I'll dialogue with them. Yeah, I also do. know you have a, a section, I think, where you uh, propose to help other uh, poets and to... Uh, hone their crafts. Yeah, absolutely. I really, I, 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 um, I do one-on-one workshops. I'm actually learning <sighs> Zoom <laughs> so that I can uh, do, uh, I mean, I know how to check into meetings, but so that I can, you know, moderate and lead meetings yeah. so that I can actually do some group uh, workshops because they are uh, both more, more more affordable. And I think for particularly writers who are at a kind of nervous state with their craft and just yeah. wanting to put it out, feel more comfortable in a group sometimes, a small group where they can get feedback oh, from a few people. Well, in conclusion, coming out of coronavirus pandemic and this renewed racial tension throughout America, there's never been a better time for love, intimacy, and understanding. And as U.S. Poet Laureate Juan Felipe Herrera states in a review, uh, Devorah Major speaks of being, of becoming, of totality. It is closer to love and color and everythingness beyond measure, intimacy. And if there was a time we need to address respect for all races, ages, cultural backgrounds, economic status, it's now. And California is an excellent role model for this collection of poems, given the diversity, its rich history, and the population, Hispanic American, African American, Asian Americans, European Americans who came out there in the 1849 looking for gold and in the Great Depression looking for a new dream. <laughs> And they sort of arrived late on the scene. And Devorah Major's poetry celebrates the infinite music inside of all of us. And thank you, Devorah, for your visit. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. And I highly recommend you get a hold of that uh, Califia's daughter when it comes out in July and look at some of those wonderful poems in there. And the listeners love and celebrate our diversity. Uh, It's great. It's not something to look down on just because someone's different from yourself and we'll talk to you again next week on middle age can be your best age bye for now you've been listening to middle age can be your best age hosted by roy richards an expert on midlife renewal and author of both a midlife challenge wake up and wake up captain and crew restart your engines you can learn more about roy and his middle age renewal training system by visiting his website middleagerenewal.com 